Welcome to your Molecular Diagnostics Lecture Course. Uh, my name is Lindsay Clark and I will be your primary instructor for this course. Today we will be introduced to the world of molecular diagnostics and we will talk about how this course is laid out and we'll briefly review the history of DNA and molecular biology. So that's what we will do for this lecture. And the objectives for today's lecture are number one, define molecular diagnostics. Number two, give a brief outline of the molecular, molecular diagnostics course. And number three, for each of the following, briefly summarize his or her contribution to the understanding of molecular biology. And that will include Gregor Mendel, Frederick Meischer, Frederick Griffith, Oswald Avery, Colin McLeod, and Macklin McCarty, Erwin Shargoff, Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins, James Watson, and Francis Crick. So you may be asking yourself, what is molecular diagnostics exactly? Well, molecular diagnostics refers to the detection of specific DNA or RNA molecules. It is the study of nucleic acids and specific nucleic acid sequences. And there are lots of different test methodologies that will utilize molecular technology and many different applications for molecular testing. Speaking of applications for molecular testing, let's touch on how it is useful in the clinical lab. Applications in the clinical lab can include detecting infectious diseases or cancer. We can test for genetic diseases. Um, we can do histocompatibility testing. And we can do human identity testing, such as in forensics or paternity testing. So there would be no MORI without molecular diagnostics. So as we go through this course, we will discuss many of these applications um, and different test methodologies. And on the subject of going through the course, here is a brief course outline. So today we are going to cover a brief history of molecular biology. Then over the coming weeks, we are going to move on to basic concepts of molecular, common techniques in molecular testing, what techniques are used in the clinical lab, and finally we will discuss quality assurance and quality control in the molecular lab. And I think you will find that the molecular lab is a bit different than maybe the core lab or micro or blood bank. Um, so the layout needs to be very specific and the workflow is very specific and it's important to maintain that workflow. And also quality control and quality assurance can be a little bit different. So we will talk about all of those. But today we're going to start with history, and I know, I know, I'm sure many of you have learned about the history before, but we're going to talk about it again because I think it's important. And why do I think this is important? Well, I'll tell you. So I know what you guys are thinking. History, really, this is a science class. I'm so over it. I don't want to learn history, but I'll tell you a little bit about myself, and then maybe this will make more sense. So this is me. And this is my giant goober dog named Opal. Um, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I went to college and I came out the other side with a history degree. Okay, so this is making sense to you now, right? Okay, history was, and it will always be one of my true loves. And when I graduated, everyone told me I should be a teacher. And I always said, not a chance. Kind of funny, huh? So fast forward a few years and I'm getting kind of bored in the museum that I worked in. So I went back to college for a complete career change and landed in the lab. Now I love history, but I love lab even more. So I spent several years in the lab and after a while I had the urge to go back to school. So I did and I came out with a master's in public health. And somehow, some way, here I am teaching because life is funny like that. I really love teaching. I have really enjoyed what I do. Um, and I love teaching science and lab sciences. So I hope that you guys will enjoy my classes. Anyway, long story short, um, I believe that knowing the history of things is very, very important. So knowing where we came from can help us get where we are going. And that is why we're going to talk about the history of molecular. And also, because Opal and her tongue shouldn't get all the attention, here's my rescue kitties, Cricket and Milligram. They're just too much, aren't they? Okay, first up, we have Gregor Mendel. 
So Gregor Mendel was an Austrian monk who studied heredity, heredity in pea plants. He discovered the basic laws of inheritance and noted that inheritance of each trait was determined by what he called units or factors. Um, now these are known as genes. So he also determined that individuals inherit one such factor from each parent. And Gregor Mendel is today considered the father of modern genetics. Frederick Meischer. So he is probably one of my favorite scientists in this whole lecture. So this guy legit took dirty bandages out of the trash and used the pus from those dirty bandages for his studies. Now, one has to wonder if this required informed consent, although probably not. Anyways, Meischer was actually smart to use the pus because pus is made up of what? That's right, white blood cells. And what do white blood cells have that red blood cells don't have? A nucleus, good job. And from this nucleus, Fred was able to isolate a compound that he called nuclein. So at this time, scientists thought nuclein functioned as a storehouse for the phosphorus atom. But today, knowing what we know, he was likely working with nucleic acids. So he was really the first one to isolate um, what they called nucleon, but we know now as nucleic acids. So next up we have Frederick Griffith. In 1928, he began experimenting with pneumococci strains and mice. So he used one pathogenic strain and one non-pathogenic strain of pneumococci, injected them into mice, and from the results determined that transformation was actually possible. So here we have a picture of strep pneumo gram stain. You can see the um, gram positive cocci. They're in pairs and they're kind of lancet shaped. Um, hint, hint for your uh, micro course. And then here we have an image of Frederick Griffith. And I mean, honestly, who doesn't love a scientist that poses with their super cute doggo? So a little more detail on Griffith's transformation experiments. So the two strains of pneumococci he used were the rough strain or R strain, which was unencapsulated and non-pathogenic, and the smooth strain or S strain, which was encapsulated and highly pathogenic. So for his experiment, Griffith inoculated mice with the rough strain, noted that the mice lived as expected. He then inoculated mice with the smooth strain, which killed the mice, which was expected because it's a highly pathogenic strain. So then he injected mice with a heat killed S strain and noted that the mice lived. So the heating process had successfully inactivated the highly pathogenic strain. Finally, Griffith mixed the heat killed smooth strain with the rough strain and inoculated more mice. This time the mice died even though the rough strain was non-pathogenic and the smooth strain was heat killed. So from this result Griffith was able to conclude that the two different strains were able to transform or exchange and acquire different traits from each other. So essentially the rough strain was able to acquire that pathogenicity of the smooth strain and the mice actually died. So in the 1940s, um, a trio of scientists picked up where Griffith left off. So we have Oswald Avery, Colin McLeod, and Macklin McCarty. And they worked together to determine that DNA was required for transformation. So Griffith figured out that transformation was possible, and these three were the ones that determined that DNA was required for that transformation. So at the time, what was well known about DNA was that it was much simpler than proteins. And many scientists still thought that proteins coded for genetic material. So when Avery, McLeod, and McCarty released their work, many of these scientists were still skeptical. They thought that DNA was simply too simple to code for the genetic material. So what exactly did they do to determine DNA was a transforming factor? Well, they essentially took Griffith's heat-killed smooth strain of pneumococcus and removed lipids and sugars, leaving only proteins, RNA, and DNA. So then they treated this solution with different enzymes. 
So the enzymes would destroy either a protein, RNA, or DNA. Next, they added the rough strain to the heat-killed smooth strain to see if transformation occurred. The smooth strain appeared in the solution that contained RNA and DNA, and the solution that contained protein and DNA, but it did not appear in the solution that contained no DNA. So this result led to the conclusion that transformation requires DNA. Therefore, DNA is the genetic material of the cell. So some time passes after Avery McLeod and McCarty, and many scientists work on many different experiments and end up with the basic composition of DNA. So we know that DNA is made up of a sugar, which is deoxyribose, a phosphate group, and a combination of four nitrogen bases, adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. And these building blocks kind of magically join together in holy matrimony and end up as the double helix DNA strand that we know and love today. But how did we get from basic building blocks to a complex twisty gene noodle? Well, I'll tell you. Erwin Shargoff was a chemist and he only got interested in DNA after reading about Avery McLeod and McCarty's report identifying DNA as a hereditary material. Remember, many scientists were skeptical of their report, but he actually um, believed them from the very beginning. And in 1949, he determined the base composition of DNA varied between species. And then he discovered that there was a fixed ratio of bases in DNA. So the amount of thymine was equal to the amount of adenine, and the amount of cytosine was equal to the amount of guanine. Now this led to what is known as Shargoff's rules. And the rules are, in any species, the ratio of A to T is 1 to 1, and G to C is also 1 to 1. And also, other ratios such as A to G will vary from species to species. So he made several very important discoveries. And it's important to note that while he did determine that the amount of A equals T, the amount of C equals G, he didn't actually suggest that those were always paired together, though it was kind of hinted at. So Rosalind Franklin, we've all heard of her, um, she was a Cambridge educated chemist. And she eventually ended up in Paris where she learned x-ray diffraction techniques, which she then took with her to King's College in London. Now Franklin was able to set up and improve the x-ray crystallography unit at King's College. And Maurice Wilkins was already working there. So Franklin was actually hired while Wilkins was on leave. And when he returned, he assumed that Franklin was his assistant. Um, he treated her as such and was not really told otherwise, and this really set the stage for what was a very tumultuous relationship. So Rosalind was the one who was able to get high resolution photos of crystallized DNA fibers. So from her images, she was able to determine the basic dimensions of DNA strands and that the phosphates were on the outside of what she thought to be a helical structure. Now Wilkins, who was working with um, Franklin. He was a physicist educated at St. John's College in Cambridge. Now his early career he actually worked on improving radar and then was part of the Manhattan Project which um, resulted in the atomic bomb. Now after his work on those war projects he began studying biological molecules like DNA and viruses. Eventually he was also able to produce x-ray diffraction images and along with Franklin's images they were able to help determine the shape of DNA. Ultimately, it was James Watson and Francis Crick who proposed a 3D model of DNA in 1953. And their original model was inside out, but eventually they proposed the model that we know today. Rosalind Franklin's X-ray diffraction images were key to getting the model right. So Maurice Wilkins, also contributed some images. In 1962, the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine was awarded to Francis Crick, James Watson, and Maurice Wilkins. 
and the Nobel Prize was not awarded posthumously, so Rosalind Franklin, who had died in 1958, was not listed among the winners. However, her contribution is more widely recognized today. And it's important to note that in 1953, Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins actually published papers in the same issue of Nature where Watson and Crick first um, published their findings. So they actually all had really groundbreaking work published in the same journal in 1953. So this is um, a quick history of DNA and molecular diagnostics and I just want you to know their major contributions um, to what we know today. And that brings us to the end of this lecture. So I hope you enjoyed reviewing some of this history and I hope you're looking forward to learning more about molecular diagnostics. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me. My email and phone number are both listed above and I will do my best to get back to you within 24 hours. Um, so please, if you have questions, let me know. And here are our references for today.